I'd like you to take your Bibles now and open them to Hebrews 1. If you were going to an Anglican church, if you lived in England, you're going to the Church of England this morning, let me be clear, I'm glad you're not in an Anglican church this morning. I'm glad to be an American and uh, by the grace of God to be a Baptist. I'm thankful for those things. Uh, but if you were in an Anglican church this morning, they would be reading this text, um, at least one that still followed the, uh, the prayer book of England. And the reason they're going to read it is probably the same reason that I would like to read it and make a few comments on it, is that it draws out some really amazing things about this child that was born and laid in a manger, this child, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we're going to read together, and if you want to read silently, um, as I read verses 1 through 11 of the first chapter of the book of Hebrews, where the scripture reads, God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spoke in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds who, being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, And let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he saith, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. But unto the Son, he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows, and thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thine hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they all shall wax old as doth a garment. This is God's word. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would speak to our hearts this morning. Thank you for the children. Thank you for what they mean to us. We appreciate the precious uh, emblem that they are, the reality that except we be converted and become as little children, we'll never see the kingdom of God. We thank you for the trusting nature, for the sweet and gentle nature of children. Lord, I pray that you would produce that in us as well, that we would look to you, our Father in heaven, with trust and simplicity and faith. God, give us these things, bless us with this. And we pray that you would bless even the children as we look at Jesus this morning and worship him. For it's in his name we ask all these things. And all God's people said, Amen. Verse 1 teaches us that God has spoken to us by his Son. He has spoken to us by his prophets, by his apostles, but he has spoken to us by his Son. When Jesus was transfigured on the mountain, he shined and his face was and his hands and all of his skin became bright and shining. There was such a voice from heaven that said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Matthew 17, verse 5. It is our privilege. It is our joy. It is our cause for rejoicing this morning that we can open our Bibles and read the words of the Son of God. God has spoken to us by his son. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. All scripture is profitable for us. But I want us to understand it is in the, the words and the actions of Christ. The things that he said and the things that he did that we see the father most clearly. 
we see the heart of the Father expressed to us when the little baby, God in flesh, allowed himself to be laid in a manger. We see the heart of God most clearly expressed for us when we see Jesus healing lepers and cleansing the temple and defending those who had no defender and then ultimately dying on the cross to pay for our sins. We see the heart of the Father in heaven most clearly in the Son of God. And do you know what the, the, the prophets did? They exposited the heart of God. Do you know what the apostles did? They exposited the heart of God. But do you know where they saw it? Not in themselves. In Christ. We see it in Christ. God has spoken to us and he speaks clearly through his son that his heart is for us. By himself, he purged our sins on the cross. And he is now sitting at the right hand of the Father in heaven. That speaks to us this morning. God speaks to us by his son. The truth is no prophet ever shed blood for you. No apostle ever died for you. No angel left the comforts of heaven and the glories of heaven to suffer over 30 years in order to bear your sins in his body. It was Jesus, the baby who was born in the manger, who loved you and who did that for you. And the glories of Jesus are seen in the early verses of our text. Verse 1, God's spoken to us. Verse 2 declares Jesus is the appointed heir of all things. And he is the word by which the Father uh, created all of the worlds. Verse 3 shows us Jesus is not only the word by which the Father made all things. He is the power who upholds all things. It's that same power that purged our sins and now sits on the right hand of the majesty on high. There is no one like Jesus. There is no prophet, no apostle, no bard, no sage, no angel who is as glorious, who is as wonderful, who is as lovely and who is as beautiful as Jesus. None so worthy as Jesus. Now, the truth is everyone has a different idea of what beauty is. One farmer ran a personal ad in the newspaper that said, Farmer looking to marry woman, 35, with tractor. Please send photos of tractor. Uh, the reality is, though, you cannot look at the truth of Jesus without seeing something beautiful there, something special. Have you ever had someone who saw you from afar and they set their affection on you. And then they pursued you. Because they loved you. And they wanted to win you. My wife has. I had to beat him up. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I was that guy. I saw her from a distance. My affections were placed on her. I pursued her. I wanted her. And the truth is that sort of love is lovely. That sort of affection is beautiful. And the father has spoken to us by his son. That that is his heart for us. I think if people could see it clearly, they, they would love him. Uh, the scripture says his, place was, his face was plain. There was nothing about him that would cause us to desire him. Nothing about his physical appearance. But little children would run to him. They were comfortable with him. Weak and sick people would come to him. Frail people would look for him. Those who were outcasts and rejects and pariahs, those who were not wanted anywhere else, would flock to Jesus and he wanted them. He loved them. And he was beautiful to everyone who saw him. He would say things like this. With, with authority, he would say things like this. Be whole. People were whole. Do you ever feel like something's missing and you wish you were whole? Do you ever feel that? Do you ever feel like something's broken and you wish it was fixed? Jesus was the one that would do that. He would say things like this. Thy sins be forgiven thee. And he had the authority to do it. The things that were broken, the things that were wrong, the things that weren't right. Jesus would set them right. It's a lovely Lovely thing. There's something beautiful about the Father. 
and verses 4 and 5 show us this is the plan of the Father. He didn't go to the angels and say, I want you to represent me. He didn't go to the angels and say, I want you to go and speak to the world for me. Who did he go to? He went to the Son. He went to Jesus. He said, no other messenger will show my heart like Jesus. No other messenger is going to show my love for the world like Jesus. And now let's begin in earnest in verse 6. When God brings forth his firstborn, his first begotten son into the world, he said several things. Here's the first thing he said if you're taking notes. Number one, the first begotten is worthy of eternal worship. The first begotten son is worthy of eternal worship. Worship. Worship is a thing that angels do, but it's not something they're worthy of receiving. Worship is something that people do, but it's not something they're worthy of receiving. Worship, according to William Temple, is this. Worship is the submission of all our nature to God. It's the quickening of our conscience by His Holy Spirit, of our minds with His truth, the purifying of our imagination by His beauty, the opening of our heart to his love, the surrender of our will to his purpose. And all of this gathered up in adoration, the most selfless emotion of which our nature is capable and therefore the chief remedy for that self-centeredness which is the original sin and the source of all actual sin. End quote. I like that. Worship can have all sorts of different definitions, but the truth is when we see the beauty of Jesus, the worthiness of Jesus, and we fall in love with him all over again, it frees us from the self-centeredness that is our original sin and the self-centeredness that is the source of all of our sin. In other words, worship is the remedy for us, for what ails us. Worship is the remedy. For creatures like us who've been redeemed by his blood, worship is the chiefest remedy against lives that center on us. It's important to recognize that worship is not noise, although it might include noise. It might produce noise. Worship is not singing, praying, or offering the fruit of our hands and lips to God. Worship is the position of our heart that makes all of those things acceptable to the Lord. And only Jesus is worthy of this worship. Number two, the Father says that the first begotten is worthy of an eternal throne. Do you see this in verses 8 and 9? To the Son, the Father says, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. God the Father calls His Son God. We were talking before the service about the original Santa Claus, the original Saint Nick, and how he punched Arius or he smote him. I don't know exactly how it went, but Arius was saying that Jesus was not God. Now that's blasphemy. The scripture is plain. God the Father looks at his son and calls him. This son, this God of gods, is worthy of an eternal throne. Uh, notice this. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Verses 8. The reality is that it's an eternal throne means that it exists outside of created space and time. It's not subject to rust. It's not subject to rot. It's not subject to decay. It is not subject to the laws that govern us. It is a law unto itself. All of us are governed by laws. And I know we don't like that, but there are laws. There are laws. How have you ever heard of the law of gravity? Yeah? Yeah. Is there a reason you stay back from the edge? When we were at the Grand Canyon, our kids just were little ones. They'd make a beeline for the edge. You'd have to grab them and say, no, stop. And I, I realized then why parents had their children and their dogs on leashes. Because I woke up in the middle of the night. Ha, oh, oh, ha, I just had this dream. My kid running off the edge. Well, they don't understand like we understand the law of gravity. There are laws of thermodynamics. There are laws that govern everything. You leave your car out in the field, it's not going to get better. The rusty fingers of time are going to come and eat it all up, right? Well, God's throne is not subject to human laws. It is from his throne that he spoke all things into being. It's from his throne he upholds all things by the word of his power 
our laws, the laws we are governed by, were given by a supreme lawgiver on his throne, an eternal throne. And guess what? He's never going to be impeached. He's never going to be replaced. He's never going to be outvoted. His throne is never going to be overrun. His rule is unshakable. It's unchangeable. There is nothing in the world. There is nothing in creation that can shake the powers of God. Uh, a lot of people look at, you know, light and darkness and good and evil, and they see, well, there's this battle going on. No, there is one God who is supreme over all things. He created all things. He governs all things. He upholds all things. He is the supreme lawgiver, and everything else, good, evil, you name it, everything else is under him. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. And he holds in his hand a scepter. You know what a scepter is, right? It signifies his right to rule. It signifies his right to govern. And in his hand is a scepter that says righteousness. In other words, all that he does is right. Everything he does is right. Only a fool, only a fool would look at God and say, why would you do fill in the blank? And let me be honest with you. I've been that fool. I've played that role. I might play it again <laughs> sometime in my life. I'm a weak, created thing. But the reality is, is that God is righteous with his own righteousness. Um, Arminian friends and Catholic friends, they don't like the idea of imputed righteousness. I didn't say this last Wednesday night, but there's a text in Romans chapter four that says he reckoned faith to Abraham for righteousness. And they say, well, that's an imputed faith. God imputed faith. And this is the idea that God imputes faith to a person and then they actually become righteousness and through their own merit, they earn heaven. And it's like, boy, read the rest of Romans three and four. What does God impute to us? Righteousness. My righteousness before God is an alien righteousness. That is, it's not my own. It was given to me by Christ. And there are a lot of people who don't like the idea of getting to heaven on someone else's righteousness. They want to get to heaven on their own merit. They want to get to heaven on their own works. But notice this. This is what the author of Hebrews is showing us. That God is the only one that does not possess an alien righteousness righteousness it is his own it's part of his nature all his works are good all that god does is right all that god says is truth do you vindicate god this morning when things happen do you vindicate god or do you blame god it'll show a lot about your perspective of him God, the first begotten, is worthy of an eternal throne. Jesus is worthy of an eternal throne. Could you imagine having an eternal ruler who does things wrong sometimes? Who messes up sometimes? Who says, well, you know, I, I let the right people in and I let some of the wrong people in. Heaven's going to wind up just like earth. Listen, God does all things good. He does all things right. And his righteousness is imputed to all who believe. The Bible says he loved righteousness and hated iniquity. You know what I do? I love some righteousness and I hate some iniquity. I love some iniquity and I hate some righteousness. It's easy for people to make their own rules. But if you look at the heart of Jesus from birth, he had nothing but hatred for iniquity, nothing but love for righteousness and the will of the Father, completely righteous. Number three, the first begotten, he's worthy, of course, of, of eternal worship. He's worthy of an eternal throne. But the author here says he is worthy then of eternal gladness. 
Notice what he says. Because, uh, notice in verse 10, because he has hated righteous, or hated iniquity and loved righteousness, because of that, or therefore, God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Because of Christ's righteousness, the Son is full of gladness. Because the Son is full of righteousness, He is full of joy. Now, this is the opposite of what us sinners often think. It's easy for the prodigal to stand on the porch of the Father and look out into the bright lights of the city and say, boy, if I were just down there, what fun I would have. If I could just be down there, if I could just do what they're doing, if I could just partake in that, I would be so happy. And you remember the story of the prodigal son. You know how it ended. He wound up eating pig slop and saying, it would be better to be a slave at my dad's house than to be down here doing what I'm doing. People may not like to admit this, but it's true. We are sad because of our sin. We are sorrowful because of our sin. We lack joy and gladness in life because of our sin. Get the picture. God, the possessor of the oil of gladness, sees the righteousness of his son and he anoints his son with the oil of gladness. And that's a picture. I don't think God had an actual uh, you know, oil that's called gladness that he poured it on Jesus. I think the picture is, is that he's covered with gladness. He's anointed with gladness because of an internal righteousness. He had an external gladness because of his internal connection to the father, his internal relation to the father. It was visible on the outside. The beauty of Jesus can be seen firstly and foremost in his joy. He was joyful. He was glad. He wasn't uptight, anxious. He wasn't hot-tempered. He wasn't quick to, to just fly off the handle as we are at times. Jesus was full of gladness. There's one thing that I think we, we miss too often, and that is that Jesus was really, really hard to rattle. When he walked into the, his father's house into the temple and he saw people desecrating the temple, what does he do? He leaves and he goes out and he spends 24 hours thinking about it and making a whip as he thinks about it. And then he walks back in the next day and he drives out the money lenders and he drives out those that change the money and he drives out the oxen. And instead of smashing the, the cages that held the birds, he commanded that the cages be carried out. At all times he was in control, even when he was angry. But consider this, no one in the world or out of it is happier than Jesus. You couldn't name anyone no matter their wealth, their status, their station, their power, their influence, who is happy in Jesus. Eternal joy belongs to him, and nothing in heaven or in earth can take it away. I've often worried as a father about my little ones, and I've thought what it would be like for them to pass away early. We're, we're, we've tried to be very careful with our children. We don't give them to other people to care for. We want to care for them ourselves. And so I've often thought they're not used to staying the night places. They may have stayed at grandma's and grandpa's once or twice, but most of the time they were with us. And I've prayed before, Lord, if you take my children, what would happen? The reality is we have two children that we never met that are with the Lord right now. And as I think about the joy of Jesus, I know that they're not worried. I know that they're not fearful. Can you imagine the first thing you see when you wake up on the other side being the happiest person who's ever lived? That's what, that's what you will see. That's what it will be like. He is full of joy. And ours who've gone on before, not just our little ones, but our parents, our grandparents, our friends who've gone on before us, they are the happiest they've ever been. And they're with the happiest person who has ever lived. Uh, let's look at a couple of verses real quick. 
Um, the writer here uses an odd word for joy. It's only used five times in the scripture. But one time is in Jude 24. I'll read that. Why don't you turn to John 17 and look at something real quick? Because Jude writes, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. That's the same oil here. The oil of gladness is translated in Jude as exceeding joy. And Jude says, Christ is able to present us before the Father with exceeding joy. So I want you to understand this. The Son is worthy of worship because the Son has this eternal throne with a scepter of righteousness. And he imputes righteousness. And God the Father says, with this actual righteousness comes actual joy. And I know this from experience. The longer I go with unconfessed sin dwelling in me, the further I am from actual joy. If you look at your joy tank and it's running low, I guarantee you there is something that needs to be confessed. There's something that needs to be made right. Look at your joy tank and it's down to E. There's business that needs to be done. There's something that needs to be addressed. Okay? But here's the question. Whose joy? He presents us faultless. That is, we're bearing his righteousness. And there's exceeding joy. Whose joy? His joy? Our joy? Listen to what Jesus prays in the garden. John 17, verse 13. Before his suffering, Jesus prayed to his father, And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. In Christ, our joy is full. Our joy is complete in Him. It is fulfilled. It is filled in Him. Heaven is a place of worship because Jesus is there. Heaven is a place of righteousness because Jesus is there. Heaven is a place of joy because Jesus is there. And so may the beauty of Christmas be yours. May you worship. May the beauty of Christmas be yours. May you experience his righteousness. May the beauty of Christmas be yours. May you experience his joy. Would you bow with me in prayer? Father, we know that we can only know the joy of Christmas as we know the joy of Christ. And Father, we know that we can only know the joy of Christ as we know the righteousness of Christ. And we recognize to all of us who believe his righteousness is imputed upon us. But Lord, we also recognize the reality of discipline. The reality of requiring discipline. Lord, for we do not always do that which is right and good in your sight. So I pray if there is someone here who knows you, but they're under chastisement, that Lord, whatever it is they're clinging to, whatever it is that they are giving their affections to above you, Father, may they confess it as sin before you and find the cleansing and the joy in that. And Lord, I pray if there's someone here who has never had your righteousness imputed to them. If there's someone here who does not know you today as you are. As the king with the righteous scepter in his hand, but also as the savior with the nail prints in your hand. Lord, I pray that they would run to you and find their righteousness, find their joy, find their salvation in you. Lord, we long to learn to rely on you as Christians. I pray that this Christmas would be special, that it would be filled with the joy of Christ as we are your people 
And we thank you for this joy. We thank you for your goodness. And we thank you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen.